Hello everyone and welcome back. From the last couple of sessions, we have been learning about error detection and correction. And in the previous session only, we learnt about Hamming codes. So in this session, we are going to observe some solved problems to concretize the concept that we have learned so far, specifically on Hamming codes. So without any further ado, let's get to learning. Coming to the outcome of today's session, today we will observe three different solved problems on Hamming codes. Observe the first question. Consider a binary code that consists only four valid codes as given below. So these are the valid codes which are given. Now let the minimum Hamming distance of a code be P. So for all these codes, the minimum Hamming distance is going to be denoted as P. And the maximum number of erroneous bits that can be corrected by the code BQ. Now our job is to find out the values of P and Q. Now as you can see, these are some options given. And here, the different values of P's and the different values of Q's are already given. Now if you remember, we observed some question like this in the session error detection, didn't we? So let's try to solve it. Now in order to solve this particular question, First, we will take the codes. Now, we are to find out the minimum Hamming distance first, right? So, with respect to this one, if we start looking for the Hamming distance of all these different codes, observe, toggling this, this and this bit of this code, we can obtain this particular code, can't we? Similarly, toggling the MSB, the LSB and this particular bit, we can obtain this particular code, right? And finally, if we toggle all the four most significant bits, we will end up having this particular code, right? So clearly, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is 3. The Hamming distance between this code and this code is also 3. Whereas, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is actually 4, right? Now, this is a way which we have already seen previously, haven't we? However, there is another way to find out the Hamming distance. Now, I hope you remember the logic of XOR gets. In case of two input XOR, if the input bits are same, the output will be zero. However, if the input bits are different, that is, one of them is one and another one is zero, in that case, the output will be one. And using that particular logic, we can also find out the Hamming distance. Let me illustrate. Say we are going to find out the Hamming distance of this particular code from this this and this code. So what we will do? We will take the first code first and then we will take the respective codes whose distance we are trying to find out and finally we will perform the XOR respectively. Now for these, finding out the XOR will be very easy. Now why is so? If you observe, one of the inputs is always zeros, right? And due to that reason, observe, here we will get the result as 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Now why is so? Apart from this 0 and this 0, which are resulting as zeros because the bits are same, for the other counts like this one, this one and this one, since the bits were different, we are getting 1s, right? So basically, with a stream of 5 zeros, if we XOR 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, we will end up having the same value. Now let's count the set bits or the number of ones in this particular code. See, it is 3. So basically, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is 3. Now coming to this one, here also we will get this particular code as the result. Now if we count the number of set bits or ones in this particular code, observe, it is also 3. Therefore, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is also 3. Now finally in here, we will get the result. 4 ones followed by a 0. Now let's count the number of set bits. It is 4. Therefore, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is actually 4. Now let's move on to the second code now. Since the Hamming distance between this code and this code has already been found in here, so now what we will do? We will try to find out the Hamming distance of this code from this code and this code. So let's do that. So here also we will first take this particular code 01011 for two different instances. Thereafter, we will take this code for this one 
and this code for this one. Let's now perform the XOR. Now, 1XOR1 1 will give us 0 because the bits are same. However, 1XOR0 will give us 1 since the bits are different. And the same can be stated for 0XOR1 as well. Similarly, 1XOR0 will again give us 1. And finally, 0XOR1 will give us 1 only. Count the number of set bits in here. It is 4. Therefore, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is actually 4. Now, let's perform the XOR in here. So, 1XOR0 will give us 1. Then, 1XOR1, one, since the bits are same, it will give us 0 only. Then again, 0XOR1 will give us 1. Thereafter, 1XOR1, one, since the bits are same, it will again give us 0. Finally, for the MSB, since the bits are different, we will end up having 1. Now, let's count the set bits. It is 3. Therefore, the Hamming distance between this code and this code is actually 3. Now, observe. For this particular code, we already have calculated the Hamming distance for this one and this one in here and in here respectively. So, for this code, all we have to do is find out the Hamming distance from this code. So, let's do that. So, we are going to take this particular code 10101 and we are going to perform the XOR between this code and this code. So, 1XOR0 will give us 1. Now, 0XOR1 will also give us 1 since the bits are different. Then again, 1XOR1 will give us 0. Thereafter, 0XOR1 will produce 1. And finally, for the MSB, since they are same, it will give us 0 only. Now, let's count the number of 1s in this particular code. It is 3. So, this is the Hamming distance between this code and this code. So, now we have figured out the Hamming distance of all the codes. Specifically for this particular code, if you observe, we have found out the Hamming distance from this particular code 10101. Then again for 4 ones followed by 0, we also have figured out the Hamming distance for 01011. And where did we do that? It is done in here. Also, the Hamming distance between this code and this code has already been obtained in this particular case. Now notice, we are trying to find out the minimum Hamming distance, aren't we? Now, let's judge all the Hamming distances. See, the value of P is supposed to be 3 only because that is the minimum value in all these distances. Now, let's get back to the options. Observe, in case of option C, the value of P is 4 and the same is for option D. Now, we just have seen the value of P cannot be anything other than 3. Therefore, the option C and D are clearly incorrect. Now, the correct choice can either be A or B since the values of P is given as 3 in here. However, we cannot finalize that until we judge the value of Q. So, let's try to find out the value of Q now. Now, we just have obtained the value of P as 3. Now, we are going to find out the value of Q, right? Now, what is Q? Q is maximum number of erroneous bits that can be corrected by the code is to be denoted as Q. Now, basically, we are talking about error correction, aren't we? Now, if you remember, in case of error correction, the distance of error correction, that is the Hamming distance for error correction, should be greater than equal to 2 into t plus 1 for t bit errors. This is what we have seen in the session error correction, haven't we? Now, in this particular equation, if we subtract 1 from both the sides, we will end up acquiring distance of error correction, that is the Hamming distance, minus 1 should be greater than or equal to 2 into t. Now, dividing both the sides by 2, we will acquire the distance of error correction, minus 1 divided by 2 should be greater than or equal to t. Now, observe, we are trying to find out the maximum number of erroneous bit, right? The maximum number. Now, for your information, whenever we perform any calculation, and say in that calculation, we are trying to figure out some minimum value, we will apply the ceiling function. On the other hand, when we are trying to obtain some maximum value, we usually apply the floor function. So, we can also state that t equals the floor of the distance of error correction minus 1 divided by 2. So, basically, this is the maximum number of erroneous bits that can be corrected by this particular code. Now, T in here has been specified as Q. 
Also, the distance of error correction we already have figured out as 3. So, we can state this as 3 minus 1 divided by 2 applied with the floor function, which gives us the floor of 2 by 2. And from this, we will finally obtain the value of Q as 1. Now, this is also correct. Because if you remember, when we studied about 1-bit error correction, we observed that the distance between two valid patterns should at least be 3. Now, the same can be stated in a different way. That is, if the distance is 3, at max we can correct 1-bit errors. Now, coming to the options, if you observe the option B, here the value of Q is 3. So, this is also incorrect, which gives us the only option A, which is correct because here the value of P is 3 and the value of Q is 1. So, this is how these questions can be solved. Let's now move on to the next question. If the Hamming code is used for transmitting EBCDIC messages, how many parity bits will be required? So, let's try to solve it. Now, if you remember, when we studied about binary codes, we observed that the EBCDIC codes are of 8 bits, right? So, in this particular case, the message size is 8. Now, we are here to find out the number of parity bits, aren't we? Now, from the previous session only, we learned that from p number of parity bits, if we can obtain 2 raised to the power p number of patterns, that many patterns should at least be greater than or equal to these many cases at the receiver side. That is, any of the p plus m, there is the message to be transmitted, which includes both the parity bits and the message bits. Any one of these bits can be corrupted. And also, there is another case where the entire message, that is P plus M, is delivered as it is. That means, none of the bits are corrupted. Now, using this particular inequation, we can obtain the value of P, right? So, this will be my suggestion to all of you to pause the video for a while and see whether you can obtain the result on your own. Okay, I think you may have already figured it out. Now, let me do the calculation. Now, in this particular case, the message size is 8 bits, right? So, on the right hand side of the inequation, we will end up having P plus 9. Now, observe, if we select the value of P as 4, 2 raised to the power 4 should be greater than or equals to 4 plus 9. Now, 2 raised to the power 4 is 16 and 4 plus 9 is 13. And this inequation is actually satisfying. So, therefore, in order to send 8 bit EBCDIC messages, we will be needing 4 parity bits. Let's now move on to the next question. If Hamming code is used, what should be the transmitted pattern for the message M that is 11011? So basically, this is the message which should be transmitted after appending the parity bits. So let's try to solve it. Now the message is given as 11011. And based on our convention of naming the bits, we have named the message bits as M1 as 1, M2 as this particular bit, M3 as this one, M4 as this one, and finally M5 as the LSB or the least significant bit. Now observe, there are 5 bits. So let's figure out how many parity bits will be needed. Now in this particular case, the value of M is actually 5. So on the right hand side of the inequation, we will end up having P plus 6. Now, if we set the value of P as 4, observe, on the left hand side, we will have 2 raised to the power 4, which should be greater than or equals to 4 plus 6, from which we can obtain the inequation as 16 is greater than or equals 10. So, altogether at the receiver side, we will have 10 different cases, which will be taken care of by 16 patterns. And in order to generate 16 different patterns, our parity will have 4 different bit places. So, let's now name them. Say those are P1, P2, P3 and P4. Now, at the receiver side, say we have four different bits, C1, C2, C3 and C4, which will be responsible for handling all the 10 cases. Now, honestly, with four different bits, we can generate 16 different patterns. However, here only 10 will suffice. So, the patterns 400001 till 1001 these 10 patterns will be sufficient in order to handle the 10 cases. Now, say 4 zeros signify all the bits are correct and thereafter, the subsequent patterns signify the bit places 
which can be incorrect. Now as you can see it is specifying 9 different bits and why so? The reason being with 4 parity bits and 5 message bits we are going to have a 9 bit Hamming code. Now observe the columns of all these. In case of C4 these are the places with 1s. So C4 is responsible for the bit places 1, 3, 5, 7 and 9. Coming to C3 these are the places with 1s. So C3 is responsible for the bit places 2, 3, 6 and 7. Thereafter in case of C2 these are the places with 1s. So C2 is responsible for the bit places 4, 5, 6 and 7. And finally for C1 these are the bit places which are having 1s. So C1 is responsible for the bit place 8 and 9. Now if you remember the association of the parity bits and these bits of the receiver side, C1 actually corresponds to P4, C2 corresponds to P3, C3 will correspond to P2 and C4 will correspond to P1. So we can also state it like this. Let's now figure out all the 9 bit places. Coming to the column of P1, observe. This is the first one, right? And that signifies the first place. So P1 will be placed in here only. Thereafter for P2, observe, the second bit place is the one with the first one. So therefore P2 will be placed in the second bit place. Now coming to P3, observe, fourth bit place is the first one in the sequence, right? Therefore P3 will be placed in the fourth bit place. Finally for P4, 8 is the bit place where the first one appears. Therefore P4 will be placed in the 8th bits place. Now in the remaining bit places we will simply place the message bits. So this is going to be our organization of the Hamming code. Since we already have the message bits with us, let's place them as they are. Now let's calculate the parity bits P1, P2, P3 and P4 one by one. Coming to P1, observe. It is placed in the first bit place, right? Now if you remember, by default, even parity is used. So we can obtain the value of P1 by judging the bit places 3, 5, 7 and 9. So let's figure out the value of P1. See, our code has 1, 1, 1, 1. That means even number of 1s. So the even parity for that will be 0 only. Let's now try to obtain the value of P2. Since P2 is placed in the second bit place, so the value of P2, that is the even parity, can be obtained by judging the bit places 3, 6 and 7. Observe, we have 1, 0, 1, that is even number of 1s. Therefore, the even parity will again be 0. Now coming to P3, since P3 is placed in the fourth bit place, Therefore, the even parity of P3 can be obtained by judging the bit places 5, 6 and 7. Observe, we again have 1, 0, 1. So, P3 will have the value 0. Now, finally, if we talk about P4, observe, it is placed in the bit place 8. And the even parity of P4 can be obtained judging the bit of the bit place 9, which in this case is 1. So there is odd number of 1s that we have in our code. Therefore, the parity bit will be 1. So finally, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 followed by 1, 1, 1 is going to be the pattern which should be transmitted if we have the message 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So in this session, we observed three different solve problems on Hamming code. Alright people, that will be all for this session. In the next session, we will observe the floating point conversion. So, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.